Well, good morning, church. I invite you to stand as you're able. Let's prepare our hearts to worship, to sing joyfully together. It's been a while since we've sung this song together. Hopefully we remember it. Let's sing. All these things are called for my heart. Telling me that I should listen. When I cast my vision upward, they try to fight for my attention. Welcome, church. I invite you at this time to greet your neighbors with the love of Christ. Give a handshake, a fist bump, or a hug. Tell your neighbor you're glad they're here. Well, as you return to your seats, I want to invite you to remain standing, actually. Uh, we're going to profess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, good morning. Good morning. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Zach, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Covenant. Welcome to worship. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. If you're joining us online, I'm so glad that you're here too. Good morning to you. Uh, at Covenant, we say it all the time, you hear it a lot, that's because it's so, so important. Our mission that we're on together is to build a community connecting in Christ. Uh, so just a quick nutshell of what that means is that we want our relationships to go beyond just common shared interests, to go beyond our, our hobbies, to be, go beyond our work, or even where we live. Uh, we want our relationships to be based on something deeper. In God's Word, in the book of 1 John, it says that in this world, we believers are like Jesus. That means that we are agents of God's love into the world in the same way that Jesus was. Um, and so this is a big charge. We want to do that together. That's what we want our relationships to be based upon. And we do that in a variety of ways here at Covenant. Uh, you'll hear more about them as, as time goes on. Um, but one of those is through prayer. If you um, have a prayer request uh, that can be personal or for the, the community around us, I invite you to grab a prayer card, fill it out, and drop it in the offering plate later in the service. Our prayer team, our staff, we want to join you in prayer for those things. Uh, if you are newer to the church and that mission that I just described sounds like something uh, that you want to be a part of or, or you at least want to hear more about it, hear it described in greater detail, what does that look like to be a community connecting in Christ? Uh, I have an invitation for you. Today, right after this service, we are having an event called Next Steps Together. Uh, Next Steps Together is a time where we're going to gather uh, you'll get to meet people from the church. You'll get to hear in greater detail about the mission of covenant from pastors and lay leaders in the church. And we'll get to enjoy some incredibly delicious fajitas together. Uh, so if you're here and you want to learn more about the mission of covenant, I invite you to join us. Stick around for lunch after the service. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the love that you have offered us, Lord. Help us to, uh, to lower our walls, to humble ourselves before you, to receive your love, to believe that we are worth loving, and in turn, to believe that the community around us is worth loving, and, and send us, God. God, be glorified in our worship this morning. Holy Spirit, come and rest on us in this space. Move with power, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, church, this is a place of freedom uh, to worship with whatever posture God leads you to today. So I invite you, you can sit, you can stand with us, uh, but either way, uh, let's lift up a joyful noise to the Lord this morning. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me and always alone for me, always alone.
We rejoice in that this morning, church, that we are children of the Most High. Amen. As we continue in a spirit of worship, I want us to remember these words from Scripture, um, from the Old Testament and Exodus. As Moses was leading the Israelites away from the Egyptians, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And when it feels like there is no way out, he's there with a solution. We praise him today that he is for us, that he loves his kids, and that it's our job to be still and trust that he's there. So just receive that this morning, that call to just be still and let's worship him.
Lord, we are so thankful. We are so thankful for you. We thank you specifically today that when it's hard to see a way out, you are still there. We're thankful, Lord, that you promise never to leave us. You're always faithful. 
And together as a body, we lift up the prayer that you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And as we're taking a seat, I invite the kids to head back to Cove Kids with Miss Patricia. I think I'm going to borrow a, a phrase from Youth Sunday last week. Natalie said, have fun. So uh, go have fun and uh, enjoy Christian fellowship together. We're going to turn together here in this space, uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me there. We are going to uh, be digging into God's Word uh, and uh, spending some time reflecting on uh, how some threads are connected. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles with you, the words will be on the screen as we together hear the word of the Lord. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This is God's word for us offered in its reading and its hearing. Together we give thanks to Lord God Almighty. Uh, would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Lord, in stillness, we come before you. In silence, we consider your thoughts and your word spoken over us. So now we ask, O oh God, that as we meet and reflect on your word, that you would meet with us by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would come to know you more and more. Lord, open our eyes that we would see, our ears that we would hear, our minds that would come to know and understand your word. Open our hearts that we would feel its power. And then I ask, oh God, that you would open our hands, that we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When the staff was gathering uh, at the end of last year to look forward to this year uh, and, and consider how God was calling us to move uh, through this year, we, we were focused on uh, Scripture. And this was one of the Scriptures uh, that, that we met around. And what was fascinating was we spent the better part of an hour just on these two verses as a staff. And, and we came to realize that there's so much meat here that we needed to offer some significant time uh, devoted to this passage in worship. So I'm here to tell you that you're going to hear the same exact scripture next Sunday. Today we're going to primarily focus on verse 12. And the next Sunday, we're going to focus on verse 13. So if you feel like, like Jason, you didn't like wrap it up and complete it through. You only read two verses. How can you not like do both? Well, we're not going to do both. We're just going to be sitting with verse 12 today. And, the, and verse 12 opens with, therefore, dear friends. Now, if, 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 if you're just coming to this text and you start reading with a therefore, what is the most obvious thing that is necessary to do? You need to read what preceded it. You, you can't read a therefore and not wonder what came before. And, and so uh, we're going to do that together. We're going to see how Paul is building this out. Now, now Paul is uh, a, a, uh, a wonderful uh, thought leader, not just in the Christian church, but just generally in that culture in uh, first century Ju uh, uh, Judaism. He grew up in a community that was known as the philosophical hub for that entire region of the Roman Empire. 
And so he was surrounded by philosophy and philosophers and, and trained in that way of thinking, in addition to his train in rabbinic, uh, in, in rabbinic teaching, so that he was able to construct complex arguments step by step. Go read Romans uh, start to finish, and, and you'll get a drift of it. But, but here in Philippians, we have this move uh, that he is making, and we read, therefore, in verse 12, and so we work our way backwards. You ready? So we, we go back to the, 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 the line break, the paragraph break before, and it says in verse 9, let's read together, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, that is Jesus, and gave Jesus the name that is above every name. Now what do we, what do we notice about this verse 9? It starts with therefore. And so we read a verse 12, therefore, or verse 9, therefore, we got to keep driving backwards here together. And as we drive backwards, we're going to uh, come to uh, chapter 2, verse 1. So let's go to chapter 2, verse 1 together. Therefore, Paul says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Now... It's growing a little bit obvious and somewhat redundant, so the game is over. For me as the pastor, yes, yes, this verse also opens with therefore. 212, 29, 21, and we're going even further back into this letter. And so we turn to chapter 1, verse 27. Are you ready? It's not that predictable. <laughs> Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, did, 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 you, did you hear the connecting thread between the two passages? Oh, oh yes, there's, there's some, some ways of, of practice and, and operation for us as Christians. We'll get to that later. But, but there is something even more explicit than that for us to, to have our ears attuned to, to know that we've arrived at the right connecting thread. You see, in 127, it says, whether I'm with you when I come see you or... If I hear about it in my absence, and then in verse 12 of chapter 2, do you remember what, I, what it said? Not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Paul restates this almost word for word, so whenever we make the connections between 127 and 212, we know we've hit on something. And Paul is saying that the way in which the community of faith, the way in which Christians are Christians, matters whether I'm with you or not. So I, I, I had a first this week. Uh, just when you think you've run out of first, you get a new one, right? Like uh, the, the, more, the more you live, the less firsts there are. But I went to an FFA uh, like, uh, competition. Yeah, that's what it was. It was an FFA competition. Now, now, who in here has been to an FFA competition before? Okay, so there's 5%. Yeah, so to God be the glory, right? I didn't know what the heck was going on. Lauren and I got an invitation from one of our church member students uh, to come to the FFA competition. And I've, I've received basketball invites, football invites, volleyball invites, theater show invites. This was a first for me, an FFA invite. And I thought, I got to do it. I mean, you only live once. So uh, Lauren and I went uh, noon on Thursday, date lunch, right? FFA, nothing better. And we arrive at the Tomball Arena. And it is a competition with Tomball students and Tomball Memorial students all in the FFA Tomball Arena. And, and we were there to watch the goats. And I didn't know what, 
was going on. Did you know that goat competition is broken up into four different weight categories? I mean, you wouldn't want a featherweight and a heavyweight boxing it out. So, uh, so the goats are broken up into four different categories. We watched all four of the goat uh, competitions, uh, and, and here's how it works. All right. Uh, all, all of the students are lined up with their goats uh, outside of the arena, and then they come in the arena, and they literally walk their goat, like bam, bam, bam. And it reminds me a little bit of a dog show. And by the way, the only reason why I know what a dog show looks like is because of Thanksgiving, right? How, how many of us watch dog shows other than Thanksgiving? Right, so that's what I thought. So, uh, oh, we bless you, bless you. So, so they were walking their goats, as it were, as one does, you know, just walking a goat along, you know, and, and, and what does a goat do? I'm not supposed to be on a leash, and they're like getting drugged, and then the teacher comes over and yanks up their tail. It's a whole deal. It's hilarious. But they're walking around the arena, and, and then they, they get to the spot where they're supposed to park their goat, and they bring them around, and then they aim them at the outside of the arena, and then they are uh, taught to stop the goat with their leg to lift the goat up and to lean the goat forward so that you see all of the goat muscularity in its hind parts. And so, I mean, I learned to, to judge goat hind part muscularity uh, over these four <laughs> different sessions. Uh, but but, but here's, here's the deal. Not all goats are happy about showing off their hind parts. Some of them are a little bashful about it. I get it. And so th th they're a little like, you know, rambunctious. And so the key is for the student to really have control to go bam, bam, and hold them there, right? But th the goats are fighting back. So the judge walks around to each of the goats and one at a time, like, pats the goat on the back, pop, pop, pats the hind parts, you know, to feel the muscles, and then goes to the next one. I began to notice something uh, with the contestants, though, and I wanted, I wanted to, to bring this for you. See, some of the contestants had really struggled with this. I mean, the walking the goat around, the dragging them there, the stretching them out, lifting them up, and like the leaning them in, like, like arms were sore and tired. And the judge would come to their goat, and as soon as the judge left and went to the next goat, the student would just be like, <sighs> and just let go of it. Like, leg would move, goat would run around, won't do what a goat does. That's what, what a goat does, by the way. <laughs> like that's, 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 no, that's not, dang it, Jason. So, so, they would just totally relax and be like, all right, when the judge looks again, I'll reset. But in the meantime, I'm not going to be focused on the endeavor. And then there were the other students. Fascinating to watch. Man, the judge would be on the other side of the rink, and that, and that student would just be like, yeah, look at my goat high parts. And just like totally stretched out, intense, like not moving, posed, and present, whether the judge was there or not. Now, I, I, you know, this might seem obvious, but I didn't fully grasp how this worked. The judge then walked them around the arena again, and when they came back, the judge started pointing, and I'm like, oh, man, he's picking winners. And bam, 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 and I'm a little confused because it, it, it was some kids that, were, uh, that, that, that had good-looking goats, but they struggled a little bit, and he was pointing out the people that, that had lost, and they went to the other side of the arena, and then he set them out and felt them again, and you want to guess who won? Was it the... Was it the student who had this relaxed posture and the disengaged manner whenever the judge wasn't looking? Or was it the student who was totally present and engaged whether the judge was there or not? Sure enough, first, second, third, they were all students that were fully present, fully engaged, the entire time. And I wondered, like, did the judge have eyes in the back of his head? No, I don't think so. I think that the way in which that arena uh, was 
uh, was showing the discipline and the practice of the students was an exemplification of the process of the work that they had put in over the course of the entire year. Those that were consistent in the ring, judge looking or not, were consistent day to day to day. That's what Paul's asking for us. Paul's saying, if I'm with you or not, be consistent. Be fully engaged. Know that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, whether I'm with you or not. Know that God has called you and invited you to work on his behalf in the world, whether I'm with you or not. And if you will pursue that, that, that work, if you, will, if you will desire Christ with all of your being each and every day, then God is being glorified in you. Now, I know this is a hard task. It's not a simple task. I don't think Paul names it because it's easy. And, and I think that the same critique that culture has of us today is the same one that Paul was fighting against in, in the first century. You know, the, the, the culture would say, uh, as a critique of the church, uh, that the church is full of hypocrites. And, and I think that there's some resonance throughout history with that critique. And we as Christians have two primary ways to combat that critique. The first is this. We need to be clear about who we are as Christians. That, that, that a pompous, uh, prideful piety is not uh, playing well in culture. And rather, we need to come in humility and Christians in our brokenness are all in need of healing and repair. Amen? Amen. And each of us as Christians are also sinners in need of a Savior. And by God's grace, we've been introduced to him. And thank God for Jesus and the salvation we have in him. Amen? And if we could get clear with the culture on the fact that we are walking this out, that we've received grace and we continue to need grace, then then we will testify to the truth of God's goodness that's available for everyone as well. The second way that we combat this is we try to walk this life of faith intentionally striving to imitate Christ with our lives. That we set this aim and we focus in on it to be his disciples and Paul describes it in two ways here in 127 he says conduct yourselves as worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ I mean that just We know, we know that we're not worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that nothing we've ever done or ever will do will make us worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet we're called to conduct ourselves as though we were worthy. Like, like we, are, we are striving and struggling after Jesus with all of our attention. Uh, whether, whether our friends are watching, our family is watching, whether we're at church on Sunday morning or we're at the barber shop on Tuesday evening, wherever we are, we are conducting ourselves as though we are worthy. And that is our aim. And then we get to 2.12, where this... This, this, this phrase, this, this scripture, both provides us with a practice and a posture to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. To work out your salvation with fear and trembling. First, let's look at the posture. Because I think that whenever we get the posture right, the practice is more, more, more ably, uh, uh, more able to follow. So first, the, the posture. The posture is, is a heart that is filled with fear and trembling. And that, that coupling is not often uh, brought together in Scripture. It's so, so interesting. Over the course of Scripture, there's much talk about fear. And oftentimes that fear is a fear of reverence, uh, a fear of awe, uh, 
and then other times, it's a fear as in uh, fear for one's life or fear of judgment. Uh, and then there's also a number of references to trembling, to, uh, to, to quaking because of an exposure to power or might. But rarely are they coupled together. It's actually only twice in Scripture, in Hebrews and in Acts. And they're both making arguments about who we are and drawing a comparison to one particular relationship in Scripture. Both, both times we, reference, we hear about fear and trembling together, it's referencing one character and his relationship with God, Moses and God. First in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 21, we uh, hear about this this scene where Moses is encountering God at Mount Sinai, uh, where, where he is receiving the, the, the law from the Lord, including the Ten Commandments. And as he approaches up the mountain, th- there is uh, thunder, and there is cloud, and there is trumpet, and there is just holy majesty, like fully weighted on that mountain. And he enters into the cloud, even though, even though as uh, Scripture accounts in verse 21, the sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Even when he was trembling with fear, he knew God had a work to be done in and through him because of his power for his people. God's presence and God's call led to fear and trembling. Now, I I do want to to note what's quite interesting here is when you look at Deuteronomy and and you see this, the Mount Sinai scene, you actually don't see the coupling of those two words, fear and trembling. So that means that the Jewish tradition orally from generation to generation and in the rabbinic uh, understanding of what Moses' experience was carried forward so that the, the, the fear that Moses had was also articulated as trembling in the early Jewish church. That it was carried forward because of its potency. And I wonder if that's because they understood what we understand. Whenever we are in God's very presence, fully exposed, authentically ourselves, there is such awe that it can lead to trembling. That God's call and invitation can be so powerful. The second reference is in uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7, verse 32. Now, this is also Moses and God, but it's an earlier scene. It's, it's in Exodus b- before uh, Moses goes back to Egypt. It's classically known as the burning bush story. And so Moses sees the, the, the bush, and it is aflame, but it is not being consumed. And so Moses approaches, and when he approaches, he hears his voice, Moses, Moses, the voice of God for him, calling him by name. And in that moment, Stephen articulates Moses' experience in this way. Chapter 7, verse 32. The Lord said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. In the very presence of God, when God called Moses by name, identified who he is and who Moses was in relationship to him. He trembled with fear. Now, again, in Exodus, it doesn't have that same coupling. This is something that is such a lived experience uh, for us as God's people that, that they have articulated something more happening with Moses. And so whenever we read in Exodus, it says that he hears the voice and it's so awe-inspiring that he hides his face and he cowers in fear. And the people of God know what that feels like when God knows you and calls you into something extraordinary to feel the coupling of fear and trembling. And God does call you. God has called each And every 
one of you into a deep, life-giving relationship with him through the power and work of the Holy Spirit. And he's inviting you. He's inviting you to, to walk that out, to work it out, and to have a humble posture of the heart that begins with fear and trembling and then leads to a practice. From that posture of the heart, we then have a practice to conduct ourselves in a life and manner worthy of the gospel and and to work out our salvation. Now, we could get stuck here. Whenever we hear, work out your salvation, we we could begin to to get curious. And some of you might say, Pastor Jason, I've heard you preach before that that I can't actually earn my salvation, that that I can't work and, and in so doing become worthy of grace. True. That's not what it's saying here. What it's inviting us to is to acknowledge that we have salvation in Jesus Christ. We have that salvation. And now, as those who are saved, we are being sanctified. That day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, God's grace is continuing at work in you. We call that sanctification. And as God's grace is at work in you, you are working alongside God to pursue holiness and to be a faithful disciple imitating Jesus in every aspect of your life. This takes some intense focus. This takes some energy and effort. And I think it begins with a desire to hear God calling you. And then responding. I grew up in a, in a traditional United Methodist uh, church. And some of you are, are wondering, isn't this a traditional United Methodist church? Not, not quite. Uh, we, we had the hymnals and the choir. I had the robe. I was in the youth choir. We sang at the early service. Why did my church torture the youth to sing at the early service? I am certain that I slept through more early services on the chancel, in front, a chancel means a stage, uh, in front of, in front of uh, all, the, all of the congregation. And yet, that's what we did. I was even in the handbell choir. Bing, bing, ding, ding. I had the double handbell. Pa, 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 pa. Right? So I was in a, a traditional church, and, and whenever we sang one particular hymn, I was struck to the heart. And it was, it was one of the more contemporary hymns of the church. You, you know, you turn to the part of the hymnal that, um, that, had, that had songs from the 20th century and some from the 21st century. And the song was, Here I Am. Here I Am, Lord. And it's a song that connects me deeply to Moses, the one who fears and trembles before the power of Almighty God, who Hears his name being called. Here I am, Lord, is his response. Here I am, Lord. It is I, Lord. I've heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, where you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. If we would hold fast to this posture of fear and trembling in the midst of our call and hear God inviting us into his kingdom work. Let us then respond as Moses responded and as we're called to respond. Here I am. Use me. Work in me. Let my life be so reflecting you that the world would know of your grace and your love. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, what an extraordinary truth you proclaim to us that, that, that we are about this business of working out our salvation, of conducting our lives in a manner worthy. And so, O oh God, we come before you humbly, knowing that this is something we cannot do on our own, 
but we need your strength and power at work within us. So we ask for your Holy Spirit, and we ask for your power. Lord, we trust in you. We, 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 we so desire you that we ask that you would move in us so that our lives would reflect your presence and your power in our lives each and every day. Help us to walk out, work out, move, so that our lives would be that grand reflection. And now, Lord, as we enter into this time of offering and worship, Lord, we ask that you would bless these gifts and bless the givers as well, that all that is done in this space and this time would be to your glory and for the furtherment of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. With us, just come forward for this morning's offering. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. You've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. Come on my soul, well don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. together church and sing a final song let's get our hands together I saw Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover but the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven signs and wonders, I have a resurrection power, the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven, my praise belongs to you forever, this is my testimony from death to life, this place for you Sons and daughters, all the blood and wash with water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. out church in belief if we're not dead we're not done let's sing this out if i'm not dead 
seated for one more second. Amen. Uh, I just am really thankful for the opportunity to come and share. I want to say, though, that uh, Molly Dare did such an extraordinary job last week that uh, I've been like, oh my gosh, how do I live up to that standard? Um, So uh, it's been a little while since I've had uh, a a kind of finance conversation uh, with the church. It's been since November, and I wanted to uh, take some time during our annual giving drive to do that. You'll uh, remember over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've had uh, Malcolm and Laura Jacobson share. Uh, They lead the the work in our annual giving uh, uh, drive. And we also had Molly Deere from uh, the chair of our staff development team share last week. And and I'll share today. Next week is Commitment Sunday. Uh, We we had a, a conversation in November, November 13th, where I shared with the church some challenges that we were facing. And I shared uh, uh, just kind of plain like how the the year was looking, how uh, we had gotten through the pandemic, and uh, what our our uh, financial structure moving forward looked like. And at the end of that, I gave three specific uh, how can you helps, and uh, and what is uh, what are the things that we could do together as a church. And so uh, I want to give an update on the first one. Uh, I think that that's a, a fair place to start. Since we last met, how how have we done? So the first uh, how you could help was our finance team was projecting that we would have uh, a $30,000 loss on the year above and beyond the investment of $92,000 from unrestricted capital into our annual budget. Uh, That that was just kind of uh, representative of some of the challenges that we were facing coming out of, by God's grace, hopefully, prayerfully, coming out of, at some point, the pandemic. Um, And so we had... uh, we gave that appeal, and the first one was, help us close the gap. And wow, um, November was a great month, and December was the best month in the history of the church financially. And I want to thank you, and uh, it was extraordinary to watch. Uh, I made some commitments to you in, in, in uh, that talk that we were going to quarterly give a full kind of uh, look of the uh, of the church's financial outlook. Uh, we did that in December, and then we were going to give a monthly snapshot in our uh, in our uh, e blast. That uh, e blast went out this week, so you might not have seen it. So I want to show you uh, first December. This is this is the month uh, chart for December. Maybe yeah, there it is. Uh, so. $109,000 of uh, income in the month of December. That's the most in any month in the history of the church. 
uh, to God be the glory. So the first, tr- the first service claps. So we're going to clap. We're gonna... Wow. Um, and you see that, that third, uh, excuse me, fourth line where it, it shows $8,000. What we've done is we've taken the $92,000 that, that we invested in ourselves uh, and, and we split it equally over the course of the months. And so um, it did show that in the month of December, uh, we had $49,000 of net income, uh, inc- uh, which is uh, netted against the $8,000 there, so still an extraordinary month. And then year to date, just to give you an update of where we are. So our fiscal year runs uh, March through February, so we have two more months left to go. Uh, and at the end of December, we're sitting in uh, a 49000 Oh, nope, we're going to move to the next slide. I should have a clicker. There, the year to date, we're sitting in a, in, in a position $58,000 uh, to the good. Now, uh, again, I want you to see that we have 87000 uh tied into that uh, unrestricted reserves committed uh, thus far through the year, but uh, this is the first time this year where our entire finance committee is uh, in agreement that we expect, even after we uh, take anticipated losses in January and February, that we are going to end the year in the good, and uh, that's a huge turn, so I want to say uh, thank you. From the first question uh, I asked of you, how you could help in November, thank you. Now, the second question was a precursor to where we are today, which was to prayerfully consider ahead of time what our annual giving, uh, what your annual giving as a family could be pledged at for the next year. And so uh, we passed out materials on the way in. Uh, now, you've gotten them uh, a couple of times now. If you were here a couple of weeks ago, we passed out materials. Then we mailed some as well. If you're a guest with us, I should have said this earlier, you Thank you for like being a fly on the wall and listening to a family conversation. I hope that the way in which we hold one another in authentic transparency reflects positively on the way we go about that, the business of being church together. But there's a couple things I want you to see in, in uh, these materials. The first is, I'm going to highlight the same thing that Molly did, the Our Plan section. Uh, and you could see uh, when you look at the increase column that that almost all of the increase is accounted for in two line items the first being personnel uh, which molly spoke to last week uh, so beautifully and so if you weren't here last sunday it is posted on our website uh, on our stewardship page and then the second one uh, that's listed there is is debt now, uh, as I shared in November, the church, when we built this facility, uh, 10 months before the pandemic began, uh, we opened and uh, we, we couldn't have anticipated the pandemic, but uh, we have $3.2 million of debt and we strategically planned to increase the debt service in our budget, in our operating budget, uh, each year for seven years and then our principal and interest payment matures uh, in the seventh year. Uh, last year, we deferred some of that increase uh, because we were hitting such a challenging uh, budget year, uh, we, we can't do that again. We need to step forward in the uh, debt service line item in our budget, and so that 36000 that's represented there is increasing and taking a step forward. That 36000 uh, gets us to a place where we cover all of the interest on our loan, and we're in an interest-only position right now, so that means that we would actually be covering that interest. Um, so Malcolm, last, uh, two weeks ago, shared that we have two goals as a church uh, this year in stewardship. The first is a common goal that we've had together, which is 100% of the members pledging. And we've had that goal for a number of years. Some years we've actually hit that, uh, and, and, and then some with some guest pledging, uh, to God be the glory. We, we've always had at least 94, 95% of members pledge. So that's something we really aim at, is all the members coming together and pledging something. Uh, but then he gave a second goal. It was reiterated last week again. And that is, uh, we know that we're facing a real challenge to meet this uh, budget request. But if we're going to do it, we believe it's possible if 50% of our, of our pledges represent someone taking a step forward. And so for some people, that's a fir- making a first-time pledge. I've never pledged before, I'm going to take a step forward. And if I've never pledged before, I'm going to take a step forward. And if you would do that, uh, we know that it will have a huge impact for the life and ministry we share and then for some of us who've been pledging uh, over the course of the years that, that have passed, if we would consider taking a step forward in our giving, uh, we think that that can help to close the gap. There, there's one more thing in this uh, group of materials I want you to look at. Now, it's the little floppy sheet of paper 
the, not, the, not the pledge card, but there's a, a, a floppier one, and there's two tools that we are offering uh, uh, as assistance in you considering how you might be able to take a step forward. The first is the side that says personal plan for giving growth. It's a, a chart of percentages across the top. Now, it, it's a tool where you uh, can see where you are in relationship to a tithe. The tithe is the biblical principle for generosity that began in God's relationship with Abraham and has continued all the way across Scripture until we arrive at Jesus, and Jesus says, give it all. And so, uh, so, so we started by operating with the 10%, right? So, so here, here in, the, in the 10% tithe framework, I wanted to provide this tool where you could see uh, what your annual earnings are on the left side, Sorry, I don't know exactly what you earn, so I don't have your income there, but you could kind of estimate and figure it out. And then I want you to see what you gave in the last year and just highlight that box. And then I want you to go over to the 10% and see where ten, what 10% would be and highlight that box. And I want to invite you to consider taking a step forward. If you are, are giving 3%, maybe this is the year to, to take a step to 5 or 6%. Or if you're giving it... Seven percent. Maybe you've been working strategically step by step over a number of years, and you've been wanting and working to to to, to achieve that uh, discipline, spiritual discipline of a tithe. Maybe this is the year for you. I remember when Lauren and I got to that, like I did a little tithe dance. I was like, yeah, you know, uh, I was so excited to be able to to faithfully uh, lean in to God's invitation to a biblical tithe. But that's a tool, uh, an invitation for you to look at. The second is. Uh, it's uh, a giving profile. It's on the other side of the sheet. A giving profile of the members and non-members, uh, uh, active non-member givers to the church. And it shows a profile of, of uh, the ranges that people in the church give in. And uh, I want you to, to consider where you are on that chart. I, I know everybody's like studying this. We've never like used this as, as guiding information, but we've had a lot of folks that have come to us as new pledgers and said, hey, I'm not ready for 10%, but could you just like give me a framework? I don't really know where to start. And, uh, and so I don't want to tell you where to start, but I'm just going to provide more information so that you could have some context. And, and I know that you're going to see, wow, there are 21 families that give 10000 or more dollars to the church. To God be the glory, there's, there's 43 families that give 5000 or more to the church on an annual basis. Uh, we praise God for that. For each and every family that contributes to the church, every single one of the, these bars rec, uh, acknowledges uh, a, uh, a sacrificial gift. And we want to invite you to take a step forward. Maybe you're in, in that largest column, that, that one to $3,000 where 37 families uh, give to the church. Maybe this is a year where you could take a step forward and... Uh, and together, we believe that if 50% of the church pledgers take a step forward, that we'll be able to meet the challenge that's before us. Um, whenever I spoke in November, I shared uh, three steps. The first was to meet this immediate year's needs, and wow, you responded. And the second was exactly where we are today, this invitation to prayerfully consider what God is inviting you to do in this coming year through a pledge. Next Sunday is Commitment Sunday. There's a, there's a card and an envelope there. Uh, we'll make our pledges together. There's also a mechanism with a QR code where you can pledge online. This is your invitation uh, to join with one another for us to be the church of Jesus Christ and to support the ministry that he's called us to together. Uh, would you stand for the benediction? Lord, we go forth from this place, ready to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Lord, that is the posture of our heart and the desire we have for the practice of our lives. Lord, use this call to shape and form each moment of each day this week. Send us forth uh, for your work in the world. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.